let's go ahead and get started today. Uh, and I'll, uh, we have a special guest as well, Dr. Lee Bennett, who I will introduce shortly. Again, this is mainly for your judgment, uh, for your information, the actual medical judgment should take place between your healthcare provider, whether your dentist or your uh, sleep physician. And uh, the note about dentists is not all dentists are created equal, just like all, uh, not all physicians are also the same specialty. Uh, there are sleep certified dentists out there and, and Dr. Lee Bennett, we're honored to have her on uh, today. And she will go through a plane kind of uh, the nuts and bolts of what our appliance therapy is. We're going to do the first 30 minutes as a presentation and then the rest of the 30 minutes is going to be on Q&A. So feel free to save your questions till then or if you, if you feel the need to ask us a question. I'm not sure how that's going to happen, but um, I'm sure there's some way that I'll get a notification. Um, a little bit about us. Uh, my name is Avi Barr. I am a sleep um, and pulmonary physician. Um, we run a telemedicine virtual or a uh, virtual sleep practice. And what we do is manage sleep issues virtually. We don't have a physical office space, but we see patients in uh, four to six states uh, growing right now, so I keep losing track, in Georgia, Virginia, Texas, Florida, Oklahoma, New York. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, and hopefully soon South Carolina as well. Uh, what we do is everything from video consultations to sleep testing to follow-up care, if you need CPAP, for example, we will ship the CPAPs over to your homes to make sure that you don't actually have to leave home to get specialist care, whether it's evaluation, whether it's a testing or treatment to make it easier so you don't start, you don't delay getting help. Um, and uh, that's what uh, we've had and uh, we've grown and uh, really uh, honored to be working with people like uh, Dr. Bennett. Uh, she is an accomplished uh, a dentist. Uh, she's not only a dentist, but she's also gone through a rigorous uh, certification to be sleep certified as well, to better understand the nuances of not only treating snoring, but sleep apnea, because uh, the distinction is definitely there. Uh, and I think most of the time patients may feel okay, if they use a simple boil and bite type device that they get online, that that itself has helped their snoring, hence they don't actually need. But I think the, the biggest thing is not to have the snoring reduced temporarily and to let the sleep apnea continue unabated. Uh, and so that's where her expertise comes in to make sure that she walks you through the steps or understanding what an oral appliance therapy is, what the downsides are, to see if you're even a candidate because there are exclusion criteria based on whether your jaw and, and shape and so on can 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 tolerate. And I think the whole idea for this talk is really an ed educational perspective to understand these things so that you then can carry on and whether you see Dr. Bennett or someone like myself to have this information with you and whether you're a provider or not to at least understand that that's available to you. Uh, she's got a thriving and big practice. So if you live anywhere in the middle Georgia area, I would really recommend you reach out to at the Hartley Bridge Dentistry um, uh, practice she had. Again, we have no um, actual financial interest except that we both represent our practices here. Uh, but this again is an open a forum. So let's talk a little bit about sleep apnea. Let's get into the nuts and bolts of it. What is obstructive sleep apnea? So we usually use the word sleep apnea and that describes both obstructive and central sleep apneas. Today, the point of the talk is really an obstructive component to it, which is where you see the airway narrowing here. Uh, the airway narrows for several reasons, whether it's weight pushing down circumferentially, oops, whether it's a weight pushing down circumferentially around the airway, or whether it is mainly the jaw slacking backwards and causing the tongue then to be dragged backwards as well. Uh, there's always elements of the sinuses involved. And I want to make sure I reiterate the point that the sinus congestion that you have may worsen your sleep apnea. It is not the sole cause usually of sleep apnea. Even your adenoids or tonsils may make your sleep apnea worse, but they don't actually single-handedly uh, uh, cause your sleep apnea. And so that's why an evaluation with a, a sleep certified dentist or a sleep physician to better understand this before going under the knife for any procedures that may be scary. Surgery scares the hell out of me, so I always like to make sure that I understand my, uh, my options before that. Uh, so yeah, obstructive sleep apnea is when your airway closes up on you and does not allow air to get through to, into your lungs. 
males are usually associated with this. I think they get sent over pre, uh, frequently to be evaluated. And I think that might change. Uh, the po patient population doctor uh, Bennett sees may be very different than mine. I usually have uh, uh, male spouses being forced in a near gunpoint by their, by their struggling uh, 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 wives because of the heavy snore. They come to us at a much earlier age. Uh, and uh, however, what seems to be happening is an epidemic of undiagnosed uh, women. Now, just to give you a broad idea, there's over 30 million people have sleep apnea estimated in the US based on large studies. However, only about eight, well, about 10 to 15% have actually been diagnosed so far. So a huge number. And the reason is a lot of times we associate the traditional loud snorer, heavy set, uh, falling asleep as as the prototypical patients, but there's a lot of patients that are much more subtle in how they present with sleep apnea, especially in females. Uh, you know, it, it it is a definitely a difference, and that's why there's many of them that get undiagnosed. And that's why when you see a dentist, if you have someone as accomplished as Dr. Bennett, uh, she will be able to recognize signs of that just by looking at your airway to see the telltale signs, which she'll go to as well. And to understand as well, I think a lot of times patients really have an, uh, are so busy with life and then whatever medical problems they may have that seem to get center stage, whether it's blood pressure issues, heart issues, depression, mental health, headaches, they frequently get shunted to different specialities who may be siloed and not aware of the association of, of sleep apnea and all these other medical conditions. And I say that, but the awareness is growing you know, you go and see your doc and the amount of time that you have. And by the time you discuss your blood pressure, your diet plan, or even your salt intake for your blood, uh, your diabetes or your sugar levels and so on, by the time that goes through, you've already exhausted the whole visit. And usually as you're walking out the door, it's like, yeah, I don't sleep well. And then what you get is a prescription of Ambien, for example, which just basically smothers you and does not actually help with the sleep apnea. Uh, so who really are, are those involved? Anyone with loud snoring or even lesser forms of snoring, such as puffing or even making funny sounds, gasping, holding their breath, uh, people purr in their sleeps. Women tend to actually manifest very, very uniquely. And so that's why they frequently, do. that's why all these pictures were here, men snoring and the women seem to be suffering in silence. Uh, I, oddly enough, I had a patient the other day who came to me because the husband finally got treated for sleep apnea. And he turns around to her and his, he's like, man, you snore too. And so after 20 years of, of, of marriage, she finally figured out she was snoring loudly. And, but it was never as loud as his. So, you know, she, she didn't take center stage until he, he got his sleep apnea treated. And she turned out to have severe sleep apnea as well. Uh, and we all know women tend to manage the healthcare within their homes. So they're always looking out for others. Uh, it's, it's time for, uh, for women to be looked out to by whether they're providers or their spouses as well. Uh, it tends to get worse, and I hear this a lot. Oh, I only snore when I'm really tired. I only snore when I'm laying on my back. I only snore yada yada because of this. But if you snore, it that's already a risk factor, regardless of when you think you snore. And if it's only happening on your back now, you don't know whether you're not on your back. Most, most patients end up sleeping on their sides, on their stomachs, as a natural adaptation to keeping their airway open. Um, so definitely want to take note of that. Weight gain can be associated with that. And I want to caution people, once you have weight gain and then you have sleep apnea on top of it, the weight loss becomes a painful process because of the effect that sleep apnea has not only on your overall uh, physical energy level. So you're already starting on the back foot because you're tired and to motivate yourself to exert energy or be more mobile is so much harder. And on top of that, when you, when you have sleep apnea or any other sleep issues that fragments or disrupts your sleep, your studies have shown as well that you build to actually feel satiated, meaning that you feel comfortable after you have breakfast to not eat anything to lunch actually gets affected. You tend to want to graze. Your body craves calories. It wants to load itself up because it's exhausted and it's stressed. And that's what the body does in, in a stressful state. It loads carbs or calories. I'll add to that too, just back to that mm -hmm. comment about the wives suffering in silence. In the practice, when we're evaluating and screening patients for sleep apnea, one of the comments that tend to be and the research backs is that for women, those are hormonal cycles. 
tend to be more mm-hmm. affected by sleep apnea as well. So we talk a good bit with women when they come into the practice or have questions about sleep apnea. We, we ask a lot about mood regulation and emotional health and mental health because the wife dragging her husband in uh, because of the snoring tends to be an issue for, for men, but women, a lot of times it's the moodiness or the inability to control hormones or mm-hmm. um, mental health that can be more of a struggle than someone reporting that they're snoring. So that can sometimes yeah. be a baseline that we look at when we're screening for sure. And, and another point about the hormones as well, women tend to accelerate their incidence of sleep apnea once they hit menopausal age because of the loss of estrogen uh, that is protective for their musculature. So like your muscles weaken after you hit menopause because of the protective effect of estrogen is lost. Those muscles include your airway muscles. So your airway muscles may have kept your airway open uh, because they were stronger. As you, as you lose that protective effect, the tendency for the airway to collapse increases. And that's when it it gets more likely to occur as well. But that's a good point. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, Symptoms. You know, I think a lot of times we shrug it off. We're resilient human beings. That's how there's 7 billion of us and we still thrive. I have a one-year-old child. I have no idea how we have 7 billion of us when when the youngs are so dependent on their oldest. But apparently we are pretty resilient. Um, And so, you know, waking up unrefreshed, you don't actually have, you don't have a Avanish bar without sleep apnea comparison to Avanish bar with sleep apnea. What does those two sleep effects look like? And so most patients sleep apnea will gradually increase as you age or as you get older, as you gain weight. And it happens in a very gradual manner. So you don't actually have an apples to apples comparison about what good refreshing sleep felt like. You brush it off, shrug it off. You know, you walk fade, have a cup of coffee and just keep trudging along. And that's when I think a lot of times pausing to see how you feel and how that's affecting you you should feel refreshed when you wake up honestly um you know i uh, like i said i had a one year i have a one year old and you know, the first three months i didn't get much sleep and i i know what unfresh unrefreshing sleep feels like and it, it is a big difference so take note of that waking up with a dry mouth and dry throat you'll say you're a mouth breather but usually the mouth breathing is an adaptation and not getting enough airway air through your nasal passages and your body then adapts by opening your mouth so that you can breathe in as much. And then finally, because bed you into your mouth is not humidified, which is what the nasal passages provide, you end up waking up with a dry throat. A lot of patients will also have acid reflux at night because the negative pressure generated when you're trying to suck, you know, when you suck a straw, for example, and you see that Bernoulli effect where your, air, your, your, your straw collapses, that negative pressure is what causes the straw to collapse. And so when you're trying to suck air through a narrow passageway at the back of your throat to get into your lungs, that negative pressure generates what drags up your gastric juices. So a lot of patients will have acid reflux that seem to be worse at night. Uh, so take note of that grinding as well. I think that's right in your wheelhouse, uh, Dr. Bennett, as well, waking up with jaw pain. Urinating at night is another common symptom that unless you're a 65-year-old guy with a prostate issues uh, issue, women shouldn't be doing this. And a lot of times patients will do the unhealthy thing, which is start restricting their fluid intake. But you should hydrate adequately. Uh, and the body actually has a natural mechanism to stop urine production at night so that you can actually get a restful night of sleep. So the fact that you're overriding the system urinating still uh, is a sign that you might have sleep apnea because of the fact that the drop in the oxygen levels that occur actually prompts a hormone to be released that actually makes you want to pee. Headaches in the morning are patients who've seen neurologists and so on and, and be on exodrine and so on for headaches. But in actual fact, these morning headaches are related to sleep apnea and they tend to get better as the day progresses when you start breathing better. They're associated with a growing number of issues, mental health, diabetes, anxiety, depression. The biggest, you know, I can look at a medication list when a patient comes, and even before I've spoken to the patient, by just looking at the medication list, my first thought is, uh uh-oh, they have sleep apnea. I hope they know it. Um, And rightfully so, when we see them and we evaluate them, they do have, there's, there's always someone that's, there must be the unlucky person basically you have not only have diabetes you have high blood pressure you have heart disease you have mental health issues and you're like man this is a lot of medical baggage you know i think good physicians or good practitioners and good providers and so on should really look into figuring out why is this person the unluckiest person with all these things hitting them what's driving it what's the underlying thing that's fanning the flames of these diseases and a lot of times sleep issues where they sleep apnea insomnia and so on it's overlooked because it's seen as a passive process. A lot of patients will have, you know, 
you know, men, for example, will, uh, I feel low energy. Oh, let me check your testosterone level. Oh, it's borderline low. Maybe we should go ahead and treat that. But in actual fact, they should be asking about their sleep. Uh, you know, patients are coming complaining of fatigue. Oh, let's go ahead and check your blood levels. Let's go ahead and check your thyroid levels. Oh, it's borderline. Let's go ahead and treat it. In actual fact, there's no one asking about sleep. And so I think it's time that we did. So I, I, you should bring it up with your provider as well. As you can see, here's a growing number of, of uh, overlap in terms of other medical conditions, the medical baggage, I call it, that patients come with you know, uh, forgetfulness, depression, for example. A lot of times, if you look at the diagnosis for depression, uh, you'll see that it overlaps significantly with, of, uh, with the effects of sleep apnea or poor sleep. A lot of patients with difficult to control heart disease also should look into whether sleep apnea. And again, when we look at the uh, pop large populations, we find that most patients in, in cardiology practices, anywhere between 40 to 60% of patients with heart failure have sleep apnea. Uh, 40 to 60% again with hypertension or even more have, have, have hypertension and sleep apnea as an overlying co underlying cause. So it's, it's frequently causing a lot of issues other medical conditions but it's really old and most of us go ch chasing after those shiny objects oh the heart failure the this but really why does this person we really have to stop back stop and step back and say hey why is this person having this why is it so difficult to control this the patient seems like they're engaged they seem to be involved in their health they seem to want to take their medications uh, but i still have a hard time what else is driving this and like I say, the Mars and Venus thing, a lot of times women will get uh, thrown with uh, uh, thrown at medications like Ambien and Trazodone and uh, Prozac and so on. And you know, they'll have their headaches treated by neurologists and sometimes get Botox injections as go ahead. Uh, and, and for years and years, and no one really asks them about their sleep. Thankfully, men uh, tend to behave more like uh, the uh, prototypical uh, patient in, in our textbooks. And so they get picked up on a lot sooner. Uh, unfortunately, men who are of, of a more slender build often, often get overlooked. Uh, so I think if, you know, I think the idea is to always ask those questions about how you feel, how are you sleeping, I think should be. And patients, you yourself as well. If you have, if you're waking up and you don't feel refreshed, you should ask yourself why. Look, see what else you can do to improve your health because the effect of poor sleep on your health is tremendous. All right, I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Bennett, and I will sit back. Go ahead, Dr. Bennett. Well, so we'll start with with this view because this is the view that we, you know, I'll typically see on a regular exam or a biannual exam for a patient. Um, and our view as dentists and our our, our goal in in sleep qualified dentistry is to use each opportunity with the patient to do a full screening, whether that includes blood pressure you know, taking the patient's medical history, but the, also the advantage of most of our treatment is done with the patient reclined. And so we're seeing the patient leaned back in the chair compared to sitting upright. A lot of times that evaluation allows us to look at the airway um, in a more sleep related position. So we're going to evaluate to look at the space, how large the airway is, is there obstruction from tonsils, what is the malum patty score as we're looking at the patient to evaluate what airflow could potentially look like? And that's the arch there around the, um, the soft palate and also looking at the uvula to see if we can visualize any stretching of the uvula that may be sign or indicative of the patient snoring over time. And then asking the questions about sleep, sleep quality. Are you waking up multiple times during the night? So we'll start with the airway evaluation. The other common thing that I see from the airway evaluation is that patients, if particularly with procedures, so a patient that's having a filling or a crown completed, if they're having difficulty reclined or during the, the crown procedure, they're having trouble breathing, they can't breathe through their nose or they're, they're choking during the procedure more frequently, then that may be a prompt that I'll use. And what I find to be a correlation is that if the patient has had any surgical procedures, they'll say no, but when I came out of anesthesia, the anesthesiologist asked me these same questions. So there's definitely the correlation between position mm -hmm. and having procedure and using the airway, which gives us just a, almost like a sneak peek. I think we get mm -hmm. the privilege of viewing the mouth because the mouth does show us so much about overall health. And we'll go through the rest of the slides to see what other points um, 
we can look at with our patients. One of the things that we see is tongue scalloping and scalloping of the tongue gives us two clues. One is about space and the other is about behavior. And rarely do I have a patient who comes in and knows that they have a daytime parafunctional habit, but a lot of patients will have this bordering in the tongue that is a sign that the tongue is too large for the space allowed. There are, those are pressure points around the tongue. And if the tongue mm -hmm. is too large to fit in the frame of the teeth, then we know that when positioned for sleep, most likely the tongue is retruded. And as the tongue gets pushed back into um, the airway, it becomes more difficult for a patient to breathe. The other common area or situation that we'll see the tongue scalloping, which you brought up, was with slender built males. Um, a lot of times the tongue scalloping is a clue about sleep apnea because of orthodontic treatment. And it could be for anyone, but particularly with orthodontic treatment, when we see a patient had previous ortho and had multiple teeth removed for straightening the teeth, the, the size of the tongue was not adapted. And so the tongue is larger than the frame that it's set in. And so those can oh, wow. be signs, especially with um, slender built males, a lot of times we'll find that there's a, a history of orthodontic treatment extraction for teeth. Very interesting. And I, I frequently tell patients as well, I say the scalloping, you know, I say with your muscle tone intact, that means you have a taut muscle tone, your tongue is pushing forward and it's pushing up against the back of your teeth and that's how you get the scalloping. But imagine what that's like when you lose your muscle tone and your tongue just flops backwards. Right. Um, I think, you know, usually I paint that picture because that kind of came in. Because thing in one really, they look at it and just see it as, as just, you know, kind of it looking wavy. But you're mm -hmm. right. I mean, you know, the idea of, and especially in your position where you see them laying down. Frequently when I see patients via telemedicine visit, they're sitting up. I have to kind of paint the picture of what it looks like when they may be laying down. Um, mm -hmm. And you see them all day with in that position. So I can imagine that that actually is a great opportunity for you. And, you know, anyone else listening as well, when you see a dentist, I think that's something they should be looking at as well. So I'm glad you brought that up. So the other component we see, and you touched on this with the issues with acid reflux, particularly that they're, they're worse at night, acid erosion shows up really prevalent in the teeth and prolonged will cause the enamel to erode away. The picture on the left actually shows acid erosion in the presence of grinding. That's a unique um, demonstration of enamel wear and is a good indication of what parafunctional habits the patient may have. Um, again, anytime there's that significant of a loss of enamel, we're going to be looking at GERD or history of GERD um, and then trying to make the connection with the patient's overall health is GERD also a connecting point to sleep apnea? And mm -hmm. if not, at, at some point it has to be evaluated and, and we want our patients to be as healthy as possible. So we, yeah. we do intraoral photography to try to capture those changes so that we can see if there are changes over time. Because sometimes a patient will have erosion like this, but have been put on a medication to reduce acid. But if sleep is an issue, we know that there's going to be that prevalence of GERD and the patient, it's happening at night. They're not, they're not aware of heartburn as they would during the daytime. So I, I call it silent reflux. It could be something that's happening and you're not even aware. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think the association, you mentioned grinding as well. I think a lot of times if you end up going to a dentist and they say you're, you're grinding your teeth, you should ask them as well. Do you think I also have sleep apnea? Because I think if, if the dentist is not attuned to the connection between sleep apnea and grinding, they may just fit you in with a, with a mouth guard or a bite block or something that, that, that does not allow, not a bite block, but a mouth guard that allows you to, you know, grind safely. Uh, but really the association between that, that arousal or your brain awakening when you have an obstructive event sends down a flush of sympathetic drive, which is that sort of like, oh my God, I'm freaking out because I'm choking but that regain or re regain of muscle tone which is what the whole brain uh, involvement is so when you awaken your your muscle tone is restored not only in your airway but also then kind of causes you to clench your jaw as well and dr Ben can speak to that a lot more and i think it's to make sure that you're not just being treated for uh bruxism or, or grinding 
but to also follow up and see whether the whether you have sleep apnea because you don't want that as a risk factor being left because that may be the only time that you come across infection between your sleep and something you're doing at night in terms of your grinding so um, anything else dr bennett well patients as far as the grinding goes patients will say well i don't grind my teeth but if you're mm -hmm. sleeping and it's response to an arousal you're not gonna the patient's not gonna be aware of it so like this picture on the left to me is is one that's concerning because that that's evidence of grinding and then that's evidence of acid reflux. And if the patient's stating, I don't grind and I, I don't have acid reflux, I, I never have to take anything for heartburn. We know that it's happening at some point because the, mm -hmm. the proof is there. So that's when I mm -hmm. want to dig a little deeper. But I don't want to just put a Band-Aid on the situation because you could, in theory, just that patient could take or see their doctor for acid reflux, get medicated and wear a night guard, but we're not treating the underlying issues. And I feel like these come, these are the signs that show up first and mm -hmm. what's going to come out later is going to be the symptoms like AFib as the patient's getting older, the more complex, if we can catch this while it's early and it's just the prevalence of acid erosion and grinding, we can serve the patient better long-term. Yeah, no, that that's a valid point. I, I didn't even think of it that way. And if this, and again, you know, it's something that even I don't see, and I'm stuck by this image because it it kind of helps me at least understand the process that I, I I'm not attuned to seeing. And I think that the grinding, like you mentioned, the grinding and the the acid erosion, uh, as being a, a telltale initial sign that gets overlooked, and like like you said, get medicated, and the patient starts feeling better, quote unquote, uh, and then that you know they kick the can down the road, and then there's no association, and I find that. Patients may feel this like, oh my God, oh, body falling out at some point as you age, because the body really can take a lot of beating when we're younger. It's just like an old, a newer car compared to an older car. A newer car, you, you know, you don't maintain it well, you're fine, but it comes to a certain point, if you don't maintain it, that's when it starts breaking down on you and all these things start springing up, whether it's atrial fibrillation, whether it's pulmonary hypertension, whether it's heart disease and heart issues, whether it's blood pressure issues, whether it's your diabetes, whether it's your fatty liver, all of these things, your mental health. I mean, the Mental Health Association is crazy because it is, and again, no, no pun intended on that one, it's just more the issue of, of us now, so I'm, so I'm going to give you a, a medication to sedate you on that one. Okay, that treats that. Oh, you're feeling down. Okay, let me go ahead and go ahead and give you something to kind of feel you a little better and stabilize your mood. But no one's really looking at what you talked about, underlying driving of this and, and to ask about what your well-being is. How do you feel when you wake up? What what do you do? What do you struggle with? And I think those are important questions. I think the medical field really needs to kind of uh, uh, do better. And I think in your case as well, I think, you know, the value of, of a sleep certified uh, dentist is, is huge because you know, you're, really, you're seeing this at such an early stage and you can help the patient avoid this downstream effect of poor health if this gets addressed immediately. And like you said, a lot of times you, what you say may ring a bell with the patient. You know, oh yeah, the anesthesiologist had said something like that. And and when you think about it, that's bizarre that they didn't bring that up with their primary care doctor. You know, that, that's something they should have brought up and, and they don't and it's because of the time or the limit that they have and and so many other issues to discuss and it's like one passing statement doesn't doesn't stick ahead um and you know i can keep talking about this but there's there's definitely an underlying frustration with how things are going yes so what is it and i'm, I'm uh i'll let dr bennett take over as well so oral appliance therapy allows us and kind of going back to what you were saying, as far as they, the patients not necessarily bringing it up with their primary care, I think a lot of times when patients hear sleep apnea, they immediately think CPAP, they feel overwhelmed by the prospect of having something disrupt their sleep. And um, CPAP is the gold standard and obviously where we want patients to be able to find relief, but doesn't necessarily mean that it's the ideal treatment for all patients. And mm -hmm. oral appliance therapy is an alternative. These are two popular appliance setups. The left is considered a dorsal. The herps is um, on the right. And those uh, appliances have fixtures that push the mandible forward and, and maintain the, um, the airway through position, a fixed position. But these two are unique uh, in comparison to some of the over-the-counter appliances that have seen that we titrate these 
and that we're actually using um, the device that's on the, well, that's, it's a, adapted by a key to move and position the jaw forward in a progressive state until we can reach a therapeutic level. Um, I will make mention too that Medicare, um, for patients with Medicare who um, are qualify for oral appliance therapy, the appliance on the right, the Herps appliance, is um, a, a Medicare for, um, approved appliance. Oh, that's great. And uh, in terms of the titration, so yeah, I, tell us a little more about what titration mean and what, what does that mean by progressing and so on. So at least patients have, a, uh, have an idea of what they can look forward to. So depending on the appliance and the setup, the one pictured on the left has a like a five millimeter opening. So the, the appliance when it's originally or initially placed in the mouth is at a set position determined by the movement, the jaw movement that the patient's capable of. So we'll get a, we'll capture the full extent of how far and how back the jaw can move and then position in what we believe is like an initial therapeutic level. And then we use the, the key function to move a quarter to a third of a millimeter advancements. Sometimes we'll move half a millimeter overnight, allowing the muscles of the TMJ to slowly adapt to the new position that's being um, provided through the appliance and opening up the jaw. I use the example for patients a lot of times if they've ever picked up a child or carried a child um, who is sleeping and they have that like limp noodle feeling mm -hmm. and the the jaw does the same thing when we're when we're in atonic sleep so what we want to do is use the appliance when your muscles are loose and the jaw is loose we want to use the appliance to lock the jaw at a position where airways preserve mm -hmm. and tight yeah, slowly moving will allow us to open that up I like the limp noodle uh, analogy, mm -hmm. and I think I'm going to steal that and use that. Yeah, so the whole idea is to actually keep your lower jaw as far flushed forward as possible that will allow without the side effects affecting you, which is the pain from the TMG and so on. So that's why you're saying it needs to be done very gradually because you need the muscles time to adapt, and it's not an overnight thing. Um, right. So definitely, I think the initial evaluation is what you do is when you, you ask them questions, you look at the back teeth, you make a mold if they are appropriate, and then you send that out and you get that fabricated for them. And they come back in for a fitting. Um, and then after that, you will then figure out where to start them off at, correct? And then you will give them guidance on how far to press at certain intervals. Yes. So we'll see them at the initial appointment and depending on how advanced the appliance is, because everyone's bite and occlusion. So the occlusion is what we consider the position of the teeth, how the teeth are occluded. So I'll have to use this. If a patient's in a normal class one or a normal bite, then we're going to have certain limitations. But there are other bites that a patient may have that either restrict or allow um, more movement. So depending on the patient's bite, we determine at the, at the delivery of the appliance, we'll determine what our strategy is going to be moving forward to titrate the appliance. And then typically we see them for a two-week follow-up just to evaluate how those are going. And that may be even a telemed visit. It may not necessarily have to be unless they have concerns with the key or the titration mm -hmm. at home. And then we see them back at six weeks. And then from there, we'll go to a six-month visit and then have the patient come in yearly to just continue monitoring. Ideally, at, at our point when the appliance has been titrated to what we find is our subjective analysis. The patient's sleep has improved. They're not waking up mm -hmm. through the night. Once we get to what I call subjective titration uh, positions, we're going to want the patient to repeat their sleep study so that we have data to support what the appliance is doing. Yes, exactly. And I think a lot of times patients are so grateful for how much better they feel sleep now or they don't snore as much that sometimes the follow-up is actually compromised and they don't follow through, which is then, which goes back to that same analogy I used about, you know, kind of just smothering this or smothering, kind of just making things normal, but actually treating the underlying obstruction may still occur. The brain arousal still occurs, the disruption of sleep, the, the effects on their health may still persist, but, you know, it's reduced by 50% and people feel great. And, 
And I think that's why uh, a good working relationship between a sleep physician and, and, a, and a sleep certified dentist is key. Because then, you know, for example, we were talking before this, this uh, live session started about a mutual patient that we had whose sleep had improved tremendously. Uh, but we did the, uh, you know, when, when Dr. Bennett had titrated the patient or uh, moved the lower jaw as far forward as she thought needed, and he felt great. We retested him with the, the same sleep study that he had initially for his diagnosis, and it chill, still showed about 80% of the vent still existed. But his improvement in his sleep was over 50% better. That's what he said. So you can imagine how much better he felt, but in actual fact, we just reduced his number of events by 20% now. Uh, and so now uh, he's gone back to Dr. Bennett and the patient will have and, and she'll evaluate him to see whether that needs to be further progressed forward. And then after that, decide on a repeat sleep study, because we really have to get those breathing events down that we see on the sleep study down. And that's when we find the health benefits improving. Um, and that's why I think most patients, it's easy to put someone on CPAP because it's a quick sort of a pneumatic splint ad you force air in. But the longevity or the sustainability of someone using it is where we get concerned and patients might tend to drop off. So I think using this as an option helps some patients and not necessarily as the primary therapy, but sometimes as what we call dual therapy, where they may have both options as well. Uh, yes. Tell us a little bit more about the severity and, and who may, you know, and, and, and how, how the oral appliance therapy works. So oral appliance therapy really is ideal for a patient with mild to moderate sleep apnea and dual therapy like you said is to me the the best scenario for anyone on CPAP even if it's a there are there are different categories of sleep appliances so there are I consider some heavy duty the dorsal and the herps those are some heavy duty sleep appliances that for a patient with normal mild or moderate sleep that they may benefit from but most patients on CPAP can still benefit from some type of oral appliance because what I find even with my patients with CPAP is that once they start getting treated with CPAP, a lot of their oral habits are continuing. They may still be grinding their teeth and putting a patient with CPAP in a typical or traditional night guard can be damaging or reduce the effects of the CPAP. So having those that like you we've talked about that partnership of care really makes such a difference but mild or moderate sleep apnea with the ahi it, the reports say up to 30 i really feel like 25 is kind of that max we mm -hmm. want to see um the patient's ahi reduced by at least 50 percent in the mild yes. category we can usually get that under five and get the patient back to normal if jaw positioning is not an issue and TMJ is not um, coming into play as far as pain or waking up with bite irregularities, um, we want to see all of those those improve. But for any of our patients with severe, we're we're going to start talking to them about oral appliance therapy in combination with uh, with the CPAP and how to make the yeah. CPAP as comfortable as possible using oral appliance therapy as an additive. Um, for moderate patients, if they can tolerate CPAP, we're still going to talk about that being really the gold standard. And what Dr. Lee is also, sorry, Dr. Ben is uh, also uh, alluding to is the fact that when you have severe sleep apnea, your airway collapsibility is, is, is compromised and you actually you may need a higher CPAP pressure to open up that airway. So if you think about the amount of airway pressure that you, or pressure that you need to kind of channel in there to keep your airway open, now imagine if if a lot of times patients don't tolerate higher pressures. The higher pressures, though, may be opening up the airway, sometimes causes a little bit of discomfort to the patient. So having an oral appliance therapy that helps open up the airway, so the all the work does not need to be done by the CPAP, makes it more tolerable. But also sometimes dual therapy can also be where you may not feel like using CPAP every night of the week, whether you're traveling, whether you're at home, and you just you know, you don't want to be bothered by putting on a mask and so on. If you want to cuddle with your spouse, uh, all of these reasons. And that's why they find the sustainability. So if you, you know, if you think about it as well, your longevity of these things, a lot of times patients want to know, am I going to be cured of sleep apnea if I lose weight? I don't know, but weight loss is a lot easier if you, if you treat it, uh, treat your sleep apnea. And then you also want to know, for example, if you might not get your sleep apnea cured completely, if, for example, weight is a difficult issue and it's a chronic issue a lot of times, 
you know, if it's if you're gonna be sleeping and let's say your lifespan is another 30 years, 40 years, using a CPAP machine every night is a big ask for from the provider perspective as well. So having options, investing in your sleep, and I know it's easy enough for me to say it, and it might be tone deaf for me to say, hey, you should get both. It is these things are not cheap, and we can uh, talk a little bit more about that, uh, Doctor Bennett, about what makes insurance and, and coverage. Um, but if you can, and it is a, an investment, and I and I and I say this because I find that we dramatically treat how you feel or how, change how you feel when you wake up and your worldview in the morning and your daytime, things that you accepted as oh my god, life is such a drag. I can't stay awake. I'm irritable. I'm this. I don't like doing that. People want to go out. I just want to stay in. You know. Treating sleep really has a huge effect on your mood and your health issues and how you feel. And I think sometimes, especially if we know you're going to be on uh, treatment long term, is to consider investing in, in, in what I would have called dual as well, which is to have this the sleep CPAP machine. And because if you put on a oral appliance later on, a lot of our machines nowadays are automatic, which means that they can type mm -hmm. the machine itself will go down on the pressure on its own. You don't have to set any changes in the machine settings and so on. So it's something to think about. Um, but yeah, thank you for that, Dr. Bennett. And now I kind of talk about the why of it. And uh, I think you've touched on CPAP being the gold standard, but I think longevity, some people find they may not like it as much as a little bit of a hassle. Uh, it requires a lot of cleaning and so on. And I, and I say this not because I'm trying to diss CPAP. A majority of my patients on CPAP, but there's a large number of patients as well who end up needing an alternative therapy because one is that they could never really get used to CPAP on a nightly basis uh, or they they have other reasons why if they have for example if they travel and they have they you know they work one place and they live some other place to ship the CPAP back and forth different I think the appliance therapy is is an option can you tell us a little bit more you mentioned Medicare coverage can you tell us more about what patients can expect in terms of potential uh, insurer coverage and what, where there are some sort of pitfalls or issues that you've come across? Yeah, so Medicare does cover certain certain list of appliances. They won't cover all of them, but they, they do have some coverage. Um, the, the biggest issue we come up with insurance, and we found that patients are able to get a lot more information from their private insurance carrier, uh, from the patient's point of view, then for us, our office as a dental practice is not considered in-network. There are no in-network dental providers for medical insurance. And so that makes it a little complicated. So we're always classified as an out-of-network service or an out-of-network coverage. So that limits some of the information that we're able to get from Blue Cross Blue Shield or Humana or any of the other private insurance carriers. The best thing a patient can do is call after they've been diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea and find out from their insurance company what their options are as far as therapeutic models. I have not come across a patient whose insurance was open to covering dual therapy. So particularly if the patient has already been assigned a CPAP and the insurance has covered CPAP, the insurance company, it's um, there are limitations to what they'll cover for oral appliance therapy. But if the patient's CPAP is effective, sometimes we find that some other appliances can be just as beneficial or help with residual grinding or residual headaches. Um, mm -hmm. A patient came in who'd been wearing CPAP for two and a half years and she had headaches. Woke up every morning sleeping much better, but still waking up with headaches. But it was related to grinding and we put her in an appliance that's sort of a hybrid between a night guard that you would think of traditional and something that was protective of the airway it wasn't an advancement appliance but it was a protective appliance and eliminated the headaches so we were able to file that to her dental insurance so the important thing is to just be in communication with the practice and to have a provider that's aware of if you're being treated for CPAP, protecting the airway during sleep, if any kind of appliance, and then finding out which modality. Sometimes it's a catch-22. Having access to dental insurance if the patient has coverage can give us a different view of options, but trying to blend the two worlds is oftentimes complicated. Yeah, no, I, and I think a lot of times the, the one point I'm trying to make here is that it is to speak to your uh, sleep physician, speak to your dentist, because 
a, a sleep physician shouldn't see everything. I mean, he shouldn't just have a hammer and see everything as a nail and CPAP, 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 and you fail CPAP. Okay, thank you for coming by. Uh, uh, best best luck to you. Is to understand what options you have as well. So the, I think the provider has to be aware of, hey, listen, we've tried changing your mask. We've tried adjusting your pressures. We've sent you to the sleep lab to get that. You know, might need a BiPAP. You've exhausted all of that, and I think the next option is to say, "Hey, listen, let's let's look up for a sleep certified dentist that we can send you to, to actually get you evaluated whether you might be a candidate." So now, insurances, like you mentioned, uh, blending those two definitely are difficult. So if you fail CPAP, and they require at least three months of use to show that you've tried uh, before being evaluated, and and for patients as well, if you're calling your your insurance carrier. The code to ask them about a CPT code is E0486, letter E0486, uh, just in case if you find mandible advancement device, too much to say, uh, which which I, I, I've also gone to oral appliance therapy because saying o OAT sounds a lot easier. Um, so I think definitely speak to your insurance carrier, but also speak to your uh, sleep provider or your dent your, your sleep doctor, or your primary care doctor, and asking them about options and bringing up questions about you know, I should see a sleep certified dentist would be the, and, and not to judge or not to make a predetermination about what's covered and what's not but what you're from a friend. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if it's better to hear from the horse's mouth, so go to the dentist, have a conversation with them, have them evaluate you and then discuss like, you know, like you, Dr. Ben mentioned about hybrid therapies. So it's not, it's not one size fits all. Uh, I think our appliance therapies have come a long, long way to what it was before. Uh, I think patients are way more open to it now. I think there's a lot more coverage from insurances as well. So I think, you know, even with, with CPAP, we find that the way CPAPs work now is so much easier. Uh, and I think you'll, you'll find that our appliance. But I just want to warn you against using those blo block devices uh, because, you know, there's a lot of advertising, a lot of direct-to-consumer sort of advertising going on. But they don't tell you about the pitfalls about mm -hmm. missing out on the you may have like sleep apnea and the fact that the snoring sounds less uh, troublesome now to your spouse is not the goal is not the goal in this case it's to make sure that you we didn't miss out on sleep apnea uh, and if we rule that out then we can definitely treat your snoring uh, whether it's by seeing a dentist or, or using a snore RF type of device uh dr bennett any thoughts no i agree i mean i think um having the full multitude of options from um, dental side and oral appliance therapy is important. And one of the comparisons I've been using, because we were recently at Disney with the kids and Disney only uses paper straws now, which is fine um, for, you know, environmental purposes. But sometimes with the CPAP, like you were mentioning, the, they auto titrate. And so if the airway is collapsed, like that paper straw, it takes a lot of airflow to push through um, for the patient to to have their apnea with a normal or, you know, to have their apnea, apnea index back to normal. But the oral appliances can give a patient on hybrid therapy, really the like plastic straw version so mm -hmm. you immediately have more rigidity and more stability in the airway that there's not as much pressure from the, the CPAP. And like you said, with AutoPAP, for the patient's machine to automatically adjust to that, if a patient has failed CPAP, I'm a lot of times asking why, like you said, instead of just saying like, oh, well, you failed CPAP, there's nothing to do here. Why are they failing CPAP? Is it the mm -hmm. airflow? Is it that they're waking up with dry mouth? Are they waking up and then not wanting to put the mask back on? Those are all questions that I want to ask because I want to determine not just is oral appliance therapy right, but what type of appliance could help you even in with a better CPAP situation. Yeah, no, I, I definitely I think that 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 says it best because I think you you, you hit the nail on the head. And a lot of a lot of times patients come in is like, yeah, you know, why did you stop? Well, I didn't really like it. I was like, well, yeah, what didn't you like about it? And was it a mask? Was it a pressure? Was it the humidity? Was it the you know mm -hmm. the, the settings on the machine now have so much of comfort features and those that really understand all of it. And it's, it's, it's to speak to someone whether it's coming to us sleep kind of uh, have an evaluation. So don't feel despondent. You know, whether you come to someone like Dr. Bennett or come to a practice like ours, is to always, and I think the next slide, 
Um, so we talk about, we, we mentioned about the success as well, right? So, I mean, I think the success also has to be balanced with, if you're using CPAP 50% of the time, but CPAP, when you use it, uh, sorts out 90% of your breathing events, that's fine. But if your, um, your, your oral appliance therapy, you use 100% of the time and it, sort, and it, it treats 80 to 75% of your breathing events, to think what may be better in this case. So if, if you really aren't using a CPAP the way you should and you felt that you worked with a good sleep physician or, or a DME company to work out the kinks and the issues and you're still really to it, don't settle because you're settling on your health, you're settling on your life, you're saying this is good enough when it shouldn't be. We have the technology, we have the resources, we have the know-how now. Please don't accept this as aging. Don't accept this as, oh, this is how I should feel and I'm fine. I'll have a cup of coffee, Dr. Barr, I'm okay. Uh, it's, I don't want to compromise on my health and I damn well don't want to compromise on your health and you shouldn't. So, you know, if you're using it not adequately, we need to find out why, work with someone good. And if you exhausted all your options, then you should really speak to a sleep certified dentist. So someone like Dr. Bennett can be a huge, huge plus on your team to figure out what the best option is. And it might be a combination which you're using a hybrid mouth guard or an oral appliance therapy with your CPAP. Or, or if you find that the oral appliance therapy works best for you, then discontinue your CPAP. And I'm assuming at this point, you might have used the CPAP for quite a few months now. You've already probably paid it off. Uh, so you're not costing any much more moving forward. And if you really feel like in terms of your health, I mean, imagine the, the, your co-pays for your blood pressure medications, your co-pay for your insulin, your co-pay for this, your co-pay for your uh, med, uh, depression medications. All of this accrues on a monthly basis. So you have to think about what that cost is going to be like to your health and your in your pocket compared to investing in while an oral appliance therapy, like you mentioned, Dr. Bennett, may be out of network and it may cost. I'm sure you all work out health, uh, payment plans as well with patients because you all don't turn anywhere at the door just because they will, don't walk in with enough money put down the amount immediately, right? Right. Yep. So, so we want to make definitely all explore your options. Definitely worth worth looking at what the options are for sure. Yeah. So I can I call my talks all along. Um, <laughs> uh, and so what we're trying to do is saw, and I think a good partnership between a sleep physician and a sleep certified dentist is key. Because a lot of times there's poor coordination of care, like the, the patient that goes into the primary care doctor's office that doesn't have time to mention that. Uh, or they go to see their primary care doctor and they do get a sleep study and someone tells them, oh, it's mild. It can't be the cause of your issues. Mild doesn't mean you don't have it. Mild could mean that, yeah, your number of events were low, but it had an outsized effect on your health or your symptoms. So really matching the results with your clinical uh, symptoms is actually key. Uh, so a lot of times, uh, not only primary care providers provide general may not be aware of oral appliance therapy, or they assume that all of it is not covered by insurance. Uh, it, I think it's it's at least behooves you as a patient or, or or someone who wants to be empowered to take charge of their health to go say, hey, listen, let me find this out. Let me call my insurer. Let me check on the code E zero four eight six. See whether it's covered. If it's not, let me speak to a sleep certified dentist, or let me get a sleep physician who will partner with me to try to find the best option available. Um, and sometimes we see our sleep issues as not important, not primary, uh, as secondary. Uh, so a lot of times, oh, I snore a little bit. Oh, yeah, I, you know, I have a couple of cup, cups of coffee. Oh, I come back home and I take a quick nap and I'm fine. Uh, and these are all adaptations. Oh, I sleep in longer on weekends. Are you sleeping better on weekends? Just because you sleep in longer doesn't mean you're sleeping any better. Your breathing events still continue. And a lot of times I think the testing burden, the treatment cost burden is an unknown field. And I think the best way to go about it is to actually get more data, which in your case for the patient is to, is to actually ask uh, and actually get evaluated mm -hmm. what the system looks like. So that's why there are people like me and Dr. Bennett around. Uh, and there may be one just like us around the corner for you as well. Uh, like I said, we do everything by telemedicine so we can meet you wherever your place of comfort is. But it's always to partner with a good sleep physician and a good sleep certified dentist. Uh, it's really so that so that this chaos that you see in front of you, which is from the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine, is easily broken down. So you actually have an idea. Uh, you're kind of shepherded along to make sure that you get the care that you need and up to the goals and the guidelines. What we have, not just feeling better, like the benefit, but some improvements. And I'll mention Any too. Because Go ahead. Yeah you're in other states depending on the state and the board uh 
allowances. There are states, I know in Tennessee, dentists are actually able to order home sleep tests. So mm -hmm. if you're seeing a dentist who's a, um, a qualified sleep dentist, they may be able to help connect the dots to mm -hmm. and order the sleep study in the state. We are not able to do that in Georgia, but there are states across the Southeast where that's allowed. Yes, very good point, which, you know, I think is, is a big downside to a lot of dentists who want to do this is the idea that they, you know, again, they are hamstrung by the fact that they may not have a sleep physician nearby that is uh, easily accessible because the waiting times, uh, they're long. And again, when a patient sees this and has to see a sleep physician, but don't forget that the primary care doctor's office visit, they have the endocrinologist visit, the nephrology, the, you know, the list goes on and a lot of times patients don't. So giving that power back to dentists, I think is, is key because the other option is to uh, push the patient back into a system that is that is convoluted, that doesn't work well, is not consent, and then risk uh, the patient not being evaluated and not being diagnosed early on, like you mentioned, the first telltale signs that the dentist picks up. Uh, so then you can avoid this cascade of medical problems that will will start uh, over overwhelming you because you know you've been uh, accruing all these sort of health issues throughout the years because of undiagnosed sleep issues, um, and then it all starts start coming undone. So I, I agree. I think I think dentists should be allowed. I think unfortunately Georgia doesn't. Uh, and we do solve that problem uh, from our perspective as a virtual sleep practice. We, like I said, we function out of many states that may or may not allow that. So regardless of that, we're able to help. So come to us, come ask someone like Dr. Bennett, you know, schedule an appointment with either one of us, and we're more than happy to help you all out. Um, I think that comes to it. Um, so Dr. Bennett, thank you again for your time. Uh, this, yeah. folks, uh, contact details. Um, uh, you can get in touch with Dr. Bennett with info at Harley Bridge Family Dentistry. Uh, you can check out our website as well. It's got a lot, of, a ton of information about sleep issues and so on. I'll call them up. And if you have any questions for us, and if you're in needs, as many like Florida, Georgia, Alabama, uh, Texas, Virginia, South Carolina, Oklahoma, and New York, uh, please reach out to us. We're more than happy to help you. Uh, navigate you through this process and, and hopefully get it, get you better sleep. And like you said, you know, like I said earlier, we're not going to compromise on your health. We're not going to accept anything as good enough. And I've had the pleasure of working personally with Dr. Bennett. And I can tell you that the quality of care that she delivers is outstanding. And I'm not saying that because she's on the, the phone, uh, on the call with us, but it's also a testament to the training that she received uh, to to make her a a, 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 a partner that I, I'm grateful to have uh, in this journey. So uh, if anyone has the opportunity to work with someone like her, uh, please take it. Uh, and we look forward to having more dentists be sleep certified uh, and helping more patients because the number of times you look down the throat and stand and get up at a point, I think that can only help your health. So I will pause and let leave the last word to Dr. Bennett. Well, I know we're a little bit over on time, but there actually are some questions in the Facebook chat. Ooh, go ahead. Um, ask. Okay, so a question. Um, can you talk about sleep medicines, when and how much to take medications like melatonin? Good question. So the it's the same way that snoring is to sleep apnea. You have to, before you start taking medications, now medications for short-term use is fine. Jet lag, uh, adjustment issues, uh, daylight savings time coming up tomorrow. Um, you know, all of these issues, whether you have, you're have you grieving for something or you have exams or a work uh, deadline, it's fine to use sleep aids, whether it's melatonin short-term, whether you need short-term prescription of Ambien, for example, um, it is fine. But when you start needing it long-term, Really, it's just like snoring and sleep apnea. You really need to make sure that you're tr evaluating for any underlying causes that may be causing you to feel like you need medications. Because it's you know, sleep is a natural, basic instinct for us, and, and it's nothing that's programmed that we have to be able to fall asleep at the same time. The body will shut down naturally. So we have to figure out what's actually causing us, not allowing us to fall asleep. And, and I think evaluated by a sleep physician is the best place to start. And I know that's a shameless plug for myself, but really trying to figure out that we're not missing out on anything else that needs to be treated that will help your sleep and reduce the dependence on medications. We also work with, because we're a virtual 
because we want to make sure that patients get care they need and we just are not a, are not a pill uh, factory or a pill mill, as you may call it. We work with uh, cognitive behavioral therapy providers, which, which is psychological ways of making sure that you know, the usual complaints of, I can't shut my mind off, I can't do this, my mind is racing at night, you know, all of these things need a, a sort of a psychological approach to it. And we work with digital, digital therapeutic companies, which is, which is basically an app-based approach to teaching you things that might be causing you need uh, sleep aids. So think about it. If you're doing it long-term, you need to get evaluated and make sure we're not missing out on something. And there are other ways as well to treat your insomnia without just being dependent on medications. I'm not trying to dis medication. I think a lot of work that we have to put into place before we say, yep, you need it every time. You need this for the rest of your life. Uh, and I think there's due diligence done on our part that we need to do. Uh, yeah, I hope that answered the question appropriately. Yes, I think so. Um, and then I will say this because I know we're, we've got some questions to get through, but I always tell patients if I don't have time to necessarily go into all of the practices, I'll say Google tips for sleep hygiene and just talk mm -hmm. about building good sleep hygiene practices can make such an improvement. So um, the next question says, I currently have a CPAP machine and while I feel like I'm getting better sleep, it still isn't great. I was going to call and see if there was another option. Any suggestions? Good point. And I think this will be one of those patients that, that Dr. Bennett and myself may work on together. Uh, but before even I do that, my due diligence on my end as a, as a sleep physician is to figure out what settings you're on in your machine, what the sleep study showed, uh, because a lot of time you get a study done as a home sleep test and you have an automatic machine, it works well for 90% of the patients. But sometimes the, the underlying sleep issue may not only be obstructive sleep apnea, there are the lesser known types of sleep apnea that may be manifested or may come about as a result of using CPAP. So we need to make sure we evaluate for that. Also, the settings on the machine are a variety, not only the pressure range, but also some of the comfort features, whether it's a REM or a RAMP, or whether it's like a uh, comfort feature that might be causing disruption in your sleep. Because a lot of times when you 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 front load a lot of comfort features, it allows sleep absolutely without being treated adequately. Uh, and so a lot of times I actually have to back off some of these comfort features on the machine and also the mask selection as well. So I think uh, an evaluation by a sleep physician is a good first step. And again, if, if if that doesn't work, then definitely I will refer you to someone like Dr. Bennett to get evaluated because the goal really of CPAP is not to use it for hours so your insurance pays for it, is to use it and actually feel better. That's going to be your, the first goal. That's why finding it, finding out what your initial sleep complaint is, is very important because and if you come to me for pain and I'm like, oh, I, I, I think I treated your pain somewhat, but hey, I, I also gave you, uh, you look better. That's not the point. I came here for pain. I want my pain treated. So if you came here and you, you have poor sleep or you don't, or you feel tired, we need to figure out why, what settings and whether an alternative therapy like our appliance that can work for you. I, yeah, I agree. Okay. So next question, I have a mouth sleep appliance and it was causing my jaw structure to change even when I used the little appliance in the appliance in the morning to readjust. I had to go back and use the CPAP machine. I would prefer to use the appliance. Do you have any suggestions as to what I can do to use the mouth appliance? So um, she's talking about what we call like an AM aligner because the mandibular, this is where it benefits to call mandibular advancement. The mandibular advancement actually does overnight advance the mandible and so we make an am aligner that patients are instructed to use in the morning to help the mandible then go back into its normal position and so i'll tell the patients your chin is going to get permanently stuck in that forward position if we're not you know using the the appliance and over long term and depending on the patient's tmj foundation that bite change is inevitable. The degree and the severity vary with individuals. So I will just give some of the tips and tricks that I tell my patients. Um, and for the, the person who asked the question, maybe these were um, not given as instructions prior, or maybe going back and using some of these tips would help. Um, but I always instruct the patient in the morning to use um, either a hot shower or some type of warm compress on the jaw um, 
at the on the side of the face to help the muscles relax a little bit. Then start placing the the AM aligner or the bite. Um, it's just you said the appliance to the morning appliance to readjust the jaw and just slowly bite into that until you can get the jaw. I do have some patients who will report. It takes me two hours in the morning. I'm working that little appliance, but it takes me about two hours before my jaw feels like it's back in the correct position. If that's what it takes for some patients, that's just the level of commitment they have to wearing the appliance and making sure that they can wear it long term. But I do think that warm compress or hot shower and just slowly exercising and massaging the masseter muscle, particularly around the the jaw, will help relax the muscle and get you back into a a more comfortable position. So trying those things or just having the titrations reevaluated on the appliance is where I would start. So Mm -hmm. if you're nearby, we'd be happy to see you evaluate the appliance or um, or get you in touch with somebody in your area that could could rework the titrations. Yeah, Um, no, I I mean, that that answer is impressive enough that I'm like, thank God that someone like you to answer that, because I would have had no idea where to start with Um, the point to tag on on that at the end is. Uh, consider going to the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine. There is a yes. membership directory of of of, page, uh, of dentists that are sleep certified, like Dr. Bennett, that's nearest to you as well. Uh, if you're close by to her, definitely look her up. Uh, but yeah, uh, is there another question? And then there is one other. Okay, and this goes in. This is the last question. Will the appliance change your jawline appearance over time? It won't. So jawline appearance, just to make sure we're clear, not not the actual shape or structure of the jaw. Um, There's no change to that from wearing the appliance, but the position of the jaw can change over time. So um, because the the appliance therapy is mandibular advancement, we are moving the lower jaw forward. And I will tell patients making sure that you do your exercises in the morning, commit to at least five to 10 minutes in the morning to let the jaw go back to its normal position. Or yes, the change would be a Jay Leno like appearance. The jaw, the lower jaw would be moving forward and you don't want to have that as a, you know, a permanent change. It can also, as the jaw is moving forward, the back teeth are separating. So some patients report more frustration with their bite change than the subtle differences in appearance. But the appearance and change is not the actual shape of the jaw, but the position of the jaw being more forward. Excellent. Yeah, thank you for that. And, and I think, yeah, poor Jay Leno, but uh, hopefully he's got a good sleep certified dentist around his place to work with. Yes. Um, all right. All right, Dr. Bennett, thank you very much. If there's no further questions, we appreciate everyone who made it here today. And, uh, you know, like the sleep page, SLIIIP, so that when we have our next events as well, you'll be notified. But keep in touch. Check out our website and check out Hartley Bridge Family Dentistry website as well for further information. We'd love to help you if we can, especially, you know, that's what we exist for. Uh, Please uh, have a good rest of the weekend. And thank you again, Dr. Bennett, for your time. Thank you. This was great. Thanks. Bye.